All right. So um, just before I get started, just wanted to kind of overall give give a thank you to OMAFRA for the, the funding for this little lecture series. So um, this kind of refresher on Varroa that, that was the theme of this whole um, lecture series. So that was uh, funded by OMAFRA to, to put this lecture series together. So um, a thank you to them for that. So if you caught the, the other lectures last week, um, Glennis Robinson would have talked about kind of an introduction to how, uh, how bad Varroa is, basically the biology of the, the, pa the parasite that we're talking about, some of the effects that it has on, on the bee itself. Um, and then Colette uh, last Thursday would have talked about the importance of monitoring and kind of how, how that is going to give us the information to be able to know when to treat, what to treat with, and, and how to treat and all of that. Um, so all of those decisions, of course, are going to help you, or all of the, the monitoring decisions anyway, are going to help you to make a decision when it comes to treatment. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to go over all of the different treatments uh, that are available that are registered here in Canada with some particular attention to kind of the, the procedures of how you would use those different treatments, um, the timing of, of when they can be used and, and how they're used. Um, and I'm also going to talk about the mode of action. So kind of biologically, how these different treatments affect varroa mites. All right, so just a kind of a quick summary of the previous talks. Uh, so we know from Glennis's talks, from talk, her talk, sorry, the varroa mites are the most damaging honeybee pest, uh, the, the main factor causing death in overwintered colonies here in Ontario. And the research that, um, that kind of helped find that and, and specifically identify that was done here in Ontario at the University of Guelph. So that is kind of relevant to here. Um, it is, it's a huge damaging pest kind of all over the world, but um, local research done shows that that's, that's the biggest thing here as well. Uh, varroa mites parasitize brood and adult bees. Um, they weaken them and they transmit viruses. So Glenn has talked a lot about um, the effect of those viruses and how, how big of an impact that has on colony health from, from the feeding by varroa mites. And then that last point there, um, it's really important that beekeepers are monitoring varroa levels regularly um, and then treating accordingly. So Collette would have talked about different ways of monitoring your colony um, and pointed out how doing a visual examination for varroa mites um, is not going to be good enough. You do need to be using some sort of monitoring method to actually know what those levels are um, so that you can actually make an informed decision about treating. Um, and of course, treating accordingly and what you treat with and all that is, is what I'm going to be talking about um, tonight. So before I get into talking about the treatments, um, an important thing to talk about um, before we, we go into the instructions on how to do them and all that um, is to always, always read the label. So I'm going to present um, some information here that's based on kind of the current labels um, and what's posted, um, but the final say should always be the actual label that you're looking at. Um, the companies that produce these, these treatments, these compounds may change the formulation slightly. And so they're going to update the, um, the instructions about how you actually use those products for them to be effective, um, but also to be safe to both you and, and the bees. Um, so um, if, if something is different from what I'm saying today, make sure you're following what the label says, because that will be kind of the most up-to-date um, information about that. If you ever need to look up a, a label for any of the treatments that are registered here, um, you can go to the PMRA website, so the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. Um, that will have a list of all of the chemicals that are registered here in Canada, as well as um, a link to the, to the instructions on how to use each of those, so for the label for each of them. So if you type in Varroa on their, on their, their um, PMRA label search, you should find um, a list of all of the, the products here excuse me, that are, that are registered here in Canada, and you should be able to open up and look at the, the instructions on how to use them. So again, that should be the final say when you're using um, a product, not what you may have heard um, at a presentation or, or from some other beekeeper. Another resource, is, another resource sorry, that you can use for looking up um, the different treatments that are registered here, um, OMAFRA's website, the Ontario uh, Ministry of Agriculture. Um, if you look at their website, there, there will be the Ontario Treatment Recommendations for Honeybee Diseases and Mite Control, and that will has um, all of the treatments that are registered here, instructions on how to use them, as well as um, 
fact sheets about the different pests and diseases um, that, that honeybees face, so you can kind of learn more about them. Um, a little disclaimer, this is not currently up right now. The, the 2014 treatment recommendations that were posted are currently being updated, which is a, which is a good thing. But so if you go look for them right at this moment, you won't find them. But, but normally, um, check out OMAFRA's website for this information, as well as lots of other information about beekeeping and, and treatments and, and everything like that. All right, well, let's talk about Varroa treatments, though. So these are the treatments that are that are registered here that I'm going to go over. And I've kind of changed or I've used the, the colors here to show you um, the different kind of classes that these fall into. So the red ones there, those are synthetic acaricides. So those are um, synthetic chemicals that are embedded usually on a plastic strip that would go into the hive for, for mites there. So apistan, apivar, and bavarol. Um, checkmite is also registered. I will talk about talk a little bit more about checkmite and how it works, um, but it kind of has a little asterisk there because we don't recommend that you ever use checkmite, um, even though it is registered. Um, the blue ones there, uh, those are natural acaricides and organic acids. Um, so formic acid, there are four different ways that you can use formic acid, um, oxalic acid, thymavar, apilifar, and hopgar too. And those last two there are, are relatively new, so people definitely might not be aware of them or may not have even seen those yet, but they are registered um, and can be used as well. So the stuff at, bottom, at the bottom there in green, those are cultural control methods. Um, those are not treatments themselves. They are management techniques that can be used to help kind of control varroa populations and slow down the growth of varroa. So they don't actually replace treatments, um, but they can kind of, by, by slowing varroa growth, they give us more options in terms of what can be used as a treatment. And they kind of lengthen the amount of um, time in between when treatments are used um, and make it just kind of easier to control varroa mites. So that is a really, really important piece of integrated pest management, um, you know, an important tool belt in, in, in or a, important tool in your tool belt. Um, I am not going to be talking about control, cultural control methods today. That's kind of um, the focus of Kelsey's talk on Thursday. So make sure you check out that talk. Um, a lot of important stuff about how you can um, complement what I'm going to be talking about here with those treatments to help keep your bees healthy. Um, and so she will talk about those cultural control methods um, with a big focus on the last point there, the varroa resistant genetic stock and how bees can be selected for um, natural mechanisms of resistance and, and kind of what's being done here in the province about that. But all right, let's, before I actually talk about the, the treatments, um, I did mention I'm going to go over the, the mode of action for how they, they work, how they actually kill the mites. Um, so a little bit of a, I guess, a biology lesson before we get into that so that I can hopefully not lose anyone when I'm trying to explain how these different treatments work. So most varroa treatments um, most acaricides and insecticides in general, they are going to act on the nervous system of, if we're talking about an acaricide of the mites, but if we're talking about insecticides, the nervous system of, of an insect. So they're, they're not very different from, from each other. So what you can see on the right there is the nervous system of, of a grasshopper, but again, it's going to look very similar in a bee and it's going to look relatively similar in a mite as well. Regardless of kind of which arthropod we're talking about there, the nervous system's job is kind of to send information around the body. Um, so a lot of information is received by the, 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 uh, the nervous system. And so that would be like sensory information. So our sensory organs like eyes and, and mouth and, and antenna in the case of insects, um, all of those are going to bring information about what's happening in the world around us into the brain. And so send a, a signal to, to tell us kind of what we're seeing, what we're smelling, what we're tasting. The nervous system also sends a lot of information out. So out from the, bit, uh, out from the brain, sorry, um, towards the, the muscles and the glands to actually coordinate motion and, and all of the activities in our body. So the nervous system is kind of sending and receiving information. That's what it's doing. And those messages are sent in the form of electrical signals. So those electric signals run along these nerve fibers um, and that's going to be important because a lot of these treatments act by somehow usually stopping that electrical signal from, from being sent along. So almost like a telephone wire with these with electrical signals running down them. Um, 
how this actually works, kind of if we look down at the nerve cells and, and how these messages are sent along nerve cells, um, it's, it's usually through what are called voltage-gated ion channels. So it sounds kind of like a mouthful, but these are just little pores or channels in the, these nerve cells, in these neurons that allow um, ions, which are charged particles, to kind of flow through them. And this changes the, the charge of a little part of the neuron, and then that causes a chain reaction um, right beside it and then right beside that. And then that's how that message gets sent along. So normally these pores are gonna be closed. So you can see that in the picture on the left there, there's like a little ball and chain that's plugging that channel. Um, when it is triggered to send a message across, that's gonna open up and those charged ions, those charged particles are gonna flow through. Um, and again, that's gonna cause a chain reaction and send that, that signal down the, the nerve cell. So this is gonna be an important target of, of some of the treatments that we talk about. Um, of course, these, these, neuro, these neurons, these nerve cells that these messages are being sent on, they are individual cells. There, there may be a, a gap in between them that's very, very small because these cells are so small, but there's still gonna be a gap. Um, so how does that message kind of jump over from one cell to the next? Um, so it's gonna be sent along that nerve by an electrical signal. But then when it gets to the end, what usually happens is that the cell is going to release what are called neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are signaling molecules. They're gonna be re released by the, the nerve cell that had the, the message kind of being sent along it. They're gonna bridge that gap. They're gonna kind of float across that gap and they're gonna activate the next nerve cell. And then that chain reaction is gonna continue. So sometimes the next cell is, an, is another nerve cell. Sometimes it is the, the, the muscle or the gland that, um, that this signal is supposed to be sent, sent to. Um, but so those neurotransmitters are gonna kind of bridge that gap. They're gonna float across and, and cause that signal to, to keep going. Um, of course, you don't want this to keep happening over and over and over again. Um, that signal, once it's been sent, needs to be shut down. Um, so that's what that little red guy uh, on the left there is. So there's also going to be an enzyme or a protein that comes along and cleans up or destroys all those neurotransmitters once the signal has been sent. And so once that's been sent, um, that's going to clean it up and stop the signal from being sent so it doesn't kind of get overstimulated um, and keep sending. Um, so again, hopefully that was just, that wasn't, I'm not losing too many people there, just a quick biology um, overview of, of how this nervous system would work um, so that I can talk a little bit about these treatments and, and kind of how they actually affect the mite. Um, but we'll start with the synthetic acaricides that I mentioned. So the first one on that list um, is apistan. Um, so this is a, a synthetic acaricide and the active compound is tau fluvalinate which is a pyrethroid. Um, and this acts on those voltage-gated um, ion channels that I talked about, specifically voltage-gated sodium channels. So in general, um, insects are, are usually pretty sensitive to pyrethroids, um, including bees. And so this is important because you can't create a, um, a pesticide or an acaricide to kill mites if the bees are also very sensitive to it as well and, and they, they die in the process of using this. Um, however, fluvalinate, um, most insects are resistant to fluvalinate, which makes it a really good option because it's not going to have as big of an impact on, on the bee, um, but it will affect the mite. So fluvalinate, it binds to and deactivates those voltage-gated sodium channels. So um, by by deactivating them, that nerve signal can't be sent along the nerve anymore. And so the mite is gonna die of paralysis. So the, the mode of action for, for fubalinate um, will be paralysis and death. That's what's, that's what's gonna kill the mites. In terms of the instructions for how to, uh, to use apistan, these first kind of points up here in the beginning, these are going to be relatively similar for all of the synthetic acaricides. Um, so they can be applied in spring or fall. Honey supers must not be present. None of these are registered for use with honey supers. If you put these treatments on while you have honey supers on, um, you can contaminate your honey and, and get those compounds in it. So you do want to make sure that you're either using this early enough in the spring um, so that you have time to kind of complete the treatment and then take those honey supers off, or you're using it in the fall after you've taken honey supers, um, or sorry, the reverse. You're using it early enough in the spring so that you can put those honey supers on after the treatment is done, or in the fall, you 
after you've taken the, your honey supers. Um, once you use the, the treatment, you do need to take it out and then have a, there's a withdrawal period of two weeks before you can add honey supers. So this is obviously a bigger deal um, in the spring. You don't need to worry about it in the fall because you're not going to put honey supers back on. Um, but in the spring, that means you need to complete the treatment and leave two weeks before you start putting honey supers on. Um, in terms of the actual application method, you are using one strip for every five frames of bees, which means in a single, um, a maximum of two strips, if you have more than five frames of bees, if you have a double, a maximum of, of four strips. These are placed in the brood nest, so kind of where, where the actual brood is, so where there are frames that actually have brood, brood cappings and everything on them, um, that's gonna be where most of the bees are kind of clustered and, and taking care of, of the, the brood. Um, and that's also where the mites are gonna be. As Glenn has talked about with the biology of Varroa, um, they can be found on the bees, but all of the reproduction is taking place underneath those cappings. So you wanna place these cells or these um, strips kind of close to the brood nest um, so that the bees are coming in contact with them as they emerge from those cells and they have those mites on them. Temperature is not a consideration for apistan or for any of the synthetic acaricides. They are contact strips. Um, and then the bees just from moving around, they come in contact with those strips. And then they also, um, the mites on them also come in contact with those, chemi those chemicals, sorry. Um, the treatment period is 42 days. So you would put those in for, for six weeks and then you would remove it, remove them after that. There has been resistance documented with with apistan. Um, what studies have shown though is that if you have not used apistan for three to four seasons or three to four years, um, generally the efficacy will go back up and, and is kind of is there again. So the mites don't retain that resistance necessarily um, for a very long period of time. Um, it still might be there a little bit, but this is what some studies have shown anyway. It kind of points to the importance of, of rotating treatments and not using the same thing over and over again. But I, I will talk a little bit more about resistance um, at the end of this talk. Um, so you can see what the apistan strips look like there. So they're the brown strips, the, the little tabs at the top, you can bend them and then um, that will rest on the tops of the frames so that you can, so that they don't fall down. Um, and then kind of an important thing that you see here in this video, the person putting that in is wearing gloves. So remember that these chemicals um, are, can be dangerous to you as a person as well. So make sure that you are wearing the proper protective equipment when you were using them. So don't touch these strips with your, with your bare hands. All right, the next, the next synthetic acaricide is apovar, and the active compound in apovar is amitraz, which is a formamidine. Um, this one acts on a different receptor and octopamine or tyramine receptors. So in terms of the mode of action, um, octopamine is, a, is both a neurotransmitter and a hormone. So again, signaling molecules, um, it's important for, for sending a message to the body for something to happen. Um, binding of octopamine is important for movement, for feeding, for egg laying, um, metabolism, learning, and memory. So a bunch of different actions um, are, are kind of made possible by this octopamine, by this signaling molecule binding to, to its receptor. Um, so amitraz is going to bind to and block those octopamine receptors, um, which kind of prevents a lot of these activities from taking place. Um, it causes loss of activity, um, loss of metabolism, weakness, and kind of eventually paralysis and death. And it's kind of important to point out um, with the, the apistan that I just mentioned with pyrethroids, that because they're shutting off those nerve signals, these nerve signals are very quick. Um, so you can kind of see paralysis pretty quickly and you often see the effects of using something like apistan um, more quickly. If you, for example, are watching mite drop with a sticky board. With something like amitraz, um, amitraz takes a little bit longer to, to work um, because it's neurotransmitters and hormones, um, especially hormones, work on a little bit longer of a scale. So it is going to kind of slowly shut off these things and cause the mite to, to weaken and die, but it doesn't happen instantly. So you don't often see as much of a mite drop with amitraz um, until a little bit later. So that can kind of fool you into thinking that it's not working, but, but amitraz just takes a little bit longer for it to start affecting the, the mite. Um, but overall, the mode of action, it's going to cause loss of activity, weakness, um, and then eventual paralysis and, and death in the mites. 
In terms of the instructions on how to use Apivar, um, again, can be applied in the spring or the fall, um, but honey supers must not be present. So it has to be used before honey supers go on or after you take them off. Um, and there is also a withdrawal period of two weeks before adding any honey supers. In terms of the application method, also one strip for every five frames of bees. Um, and you're also gonna place it in the brood nest, pretty similar to Apistan. Temperature is also not a consideration and this, the treatment period is also 42 days or six weeks. Um, there is an extra stipulation on the label for Apivar specifically. Um, if the cluster has moved away, when you, when you first put these strips in, um, let's say it's, it's kind of early or mid-September at the latest, um, the bees may still be kind of moving around the entire hive quite a bit. They might not be clustering, um, but obviously as th this treatment is gonna take six weeks. So as the bees get a little bit colder and they start to cluster more, um, they may slightly move away from those strips. So if you do come back a few weeks later to check and they have moved away, um, or you come back much further than in the middle of the treatment, um, you can kind of reposition those strips and then you would leave it on for another 14 days. Um, but as a, after a maximum of 56 days, those strips do need to be removed. So. Um, 42 to 56 days um, is the, the treatment period for Apivar. So same thing, uh, make sure you're wearing gloves when you put those strips on, your positioning is pretty similar. There is a little tab that you can bend out to, to hook them up. They have a tendency to kind of push back up and then fall in between the frames, making it very difficult to remove them. But if I show you, if you see the strips here, you can kind of see the little, um, the little hole up at the top there. Um, so a better way to put the ape of our strips in instead of using the, that tab is to use something like a toothpick, put the toothpick through that hole and then rest the toothpick across the, the two frames. And that will hold it up much better and it will make it much easier to remove them when the treatment period is done. Um, the next strip is Baverol. Um, this is another synthetic acaricide. The active compound is flumethrin, which is also a pyrethroid, so like um, fluvalinate in apistan. Um, and it also acts on voltage-gated sodium channels. So very similar to fluvalinate, flumethrin binds to and deactivates those voltage-gated channels, the sodium channels, um, which blocks a nerve signal from being sent, and the mite is going to be paralyzed and die. Because these are both pyrethroids, and because they both act on the same type of voltage-gated channel, you can see cross-resistance between these two. So if you have used Apistand a lot in the past, and you find that when you monitor after your treatments, you're finding that it doesn't work very well, um, there is a good chance that there will be cross-resistance and flumethrin will also not work. Um, so, so be mindful of that. But again, the mode of action is going to be um, paralysis and death by shutting off those, those nerve signals. In terms of instructions, very similar to Apistan and Apivar applied in spring or fall. Honey supers can't be present. Withdrawal period of two weeks before adding honey supers. Um, the big difference with, with Baverol compared to the other two strips is that you use double the amount. So it is two strips for every five frames of bees. So a maximum of four strips for a single, and a maximum of eight strips for a double. So these strips are a little bit cheaper per strip than, um, than Apivar and Apistan, but overall it does end up being a more expensive treatment than the other two. Um, temperature is also not a consideration. Your placement in the brood nest will be similar, um, and then also a 42-day or, or six-week treatment period. If you are treating doubles, um, the strips from the bottom box, you can hook them into, there's a little kind of like a slit at the bottom of the strips and you can hook the top strip onto the bottom on that way so that you can more easily put it from kind of just from the top box without actually cracking the two boxes if you're running doubles, um, which makes placement and removal uh, a little bit easier. And so this is what a Baverol strip looks like. You can see those two little kind of hooks that you can bend over and hook over a frame. Um, and if you look at the bottom of the strip, you can see that little slit there that you can hook another strip into if you're treating a double and try to slide it down in between. Um, can still be difficult, so you might need to crack the boxes anyway um, to make sure that you can put them in properly and also remove them properly. So the final 
synthetic acaricide that is registered is checkmite, um, and the active compound is cumaphos, which is an organophosphate, and it acts on an, an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. And so I showed you this little diagram here of how those neurotransmitters can go across that gap um, and continue to send a signal to the next nerve cell or to the next muscle. Um, but then I mentioned this, this um, little guy in red there that's going to come and destroy those neurotransmitters once the, uh, the signal has already been sent. So acetylcholinesterase is one of those enzymes. So that's its role in this whole process. So cumaphos um, blocks the action of that enzyme acetylcholinesterase, which is important for destroying the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Um, so that's going to lead to the nerve signal being shut off. Acetylcholine will send the message, and then acetylcholinesterase comes around and cleans that up so that the message um, or the nerve signal gets shut off. Um, so if cumaphos blocks the enzyme, the action of that enzyme, um, basically the, the nerve signal kind of doesn't get shut off. So instead of causing paralysis, like the ones I've talked about before, this one kills the mite by overstimulation. Essentially the signal doesn't get shut off um, and the, the mite dies from twitching and convulsions. So muscle twitching, convulsions, death is, is the mode of action for Kumafos. Um, in terms of instructions for checkmite, um, like I said, this is not a treatment that we recommend using, despite the fact that it is um, still registered. There is very widespread resistance to Kumafos, so mites are just not affected by it. Um, so we don't recommend that beekeepers use it. Um, and one of the big reasons for that is the fact that Kumafos takes a very long time to break down in the hive. Um, so when it's used, you get these small residues of cumafos that stick around in the hive embedded in the wax for years and years and years. Um, and because the mites are exposed to such low levels of it on a constant basis, um, that's really what led to resistance developing in the first place. Um, so that's why you don't wanna use it. And of course, the fact that that cumafos sticks around in your wax for a long time um, causes contamination. So another reason that you, you don't wanna use it. So um, just stay away from, from checking it. All right, so that brings us to the natural acaricides and organic acids. So two disclaimers I like to point out before we start talking about um, natural and organic compounds. Um, number one is, is that there are a lot of beekeepers who want to do a more of an organic type of management. Um, so the first thing I like to point out is that organic management does not mean not treating at all. So varroa mites, like Glennis talked about, are an incredibly damaging parasite. If you leave it, it will kill your colonies. Um, and the nature of beekeeping in the beekeeping industry is that you are also having an impact on all of your nearby neighbors who are beekeepers, as well as native pollinators that aren't even honeybees. So um, it's just a, it's a really irresponsible thing to do to just not treat at all and let colonies get really sick and die from varroa mites. Um, so if you want to do organic management, that's, that's awesome. And that's, that's an option you can definitely do. That doesn't mean treatment free. All of the, the treatments that I'm going to talk about now, the natural acaricides and organic acids um, are, are acceptable for use with organic management. Uh, the other disclaimer I like to, to point out when we're talking about natural and organic compounds is that natural and organic does not mean safe. These chemicals are still strong damaging chemicals, you can definitely damage your bees and your hive, and you can also damage or hurt yourself. So make sure that you are using them properly so that you're, you're not causing damage to yourself or your bees. Um, make sure that you're wearing the, the, the appropriate PPE with these, because again, um, they are not safe just because they are, they are organic or natural. All right. So the first, the first one's up here, uh, this would be formic acid. So there are four different ways of using this. So there's the form, the liquid formic acid, the 65%, um, two different methods of using that. And then there are two commercial products, uh, Max or Mitoway Quick Strips and Formic Pro. So um, I'll go over how to use all of those, but the active compound in all of those is, is formic acid, which is an organic acid. Um, what you're going to see with a lot of the, the mode of action for these is that organic treatments, a lot of these natural compounds act on a lot of different things. And it's not always 100% clear um, which one is kind of the most important one for killing the mites. But so you're going to see usually a, a bigger list on the acts on side for, for these ones as, a, as opposed to the synthetic acaricides. Um, but they affect the electron transport chain. So this is 
um, an important process in cellular respiration. So basically how our cells take oxygen and sugar and break that down and, and make energy out of it. Um, so they, so formic acid disrupts that, um, it disrupts or acts on protein synthesis, um, cells and cell contents, but I'll, I'll talk about that more. So like I said, it affects the electron transport chain um, at many different sites. So it's, it's not as specific as a lot of these synthetic acaricides are. So it will affect it at different genes and different enzymes and really disrupt that whole process. If you disrupt cellular respiration, if you disrupt how the body kind of creates energy, um, you're going to slowly start to shut down and stop powering things like muscles and all of the physiological processes um, that would happen in the body. So in addition to doing that, um, formic acid is, is also a strong acid. It destroys proteins in the body um, as well as reducing protein synthesis. So it's destroying the proteins that are there and preventing new ones from being created. Um, and it also releases something called free radicals. So you may have heard about free radicals in the context of nutrition. So we, we often talk about things like antioxidants and you know what kinds of foods are high in antioxidants. Um, so the reason why you want an antioxidant is because the, their role is to kind of go around the body and they um, absorb or, or get rid of free radicals. And free radicals are basically just these very reactive comp compounds that kind of are like little bombs. They go off and they kind of disrupt and, and destroy parts of the cell, um, cell walls and things like that. So these antioxidants are important because they help clean those up and get rid of them. So um, high levels of free radicals lead to something called oxidative stress. So formic acid can, can release free radicals and cause this damage. So mites as a, as a, uh, a result of all of the above are going to kind of get weak and tremble. They often stop feeding and they eventually die as their organs get shut down and their, their cells are destroyed. So the mode of action will be weakness and trembling, oxidative stress, cell and cell content destruction. So a lot of different ways that formic acid acts. In terms of the instructions on how to use it, I will go over the two different application methods using liquid formic acid, and then I'll talk about the two commercial products. Um, so formic acid, the 65% the liquid, you can buy that in a, in a jug. Um, formic acid, two of the products that, that contain it um, are registered for use with honey supers, um, but the, the liquid formic acid that can be applied in two different ways has not been tested in that way and it is not registered that way. So even though they, they all contain and they all use formic acid, um, these two methods I'm gonna talk about first are not registered for use with honey super. So you can, like the synthetic strips, you can only use them in the spring or the fall when there are no honey supers. Um, and there is a, a withdrawal period of two weeks before adding honey supers as well. So the first method I'll go over is the multiple application method. Um, so you are going to use these little absorbent pads. It's kind of a, an absorbent pad surrounded in a plastic um, wrapper of sorts with little holes. Um, it is the same kind of pad that's used with raw meat. If you buy raw meat at the grocery store to, to absorb blood, um, don't use a, a, a used meat pad one for this. You can just buy this at a bee equipment store, um, the, the fresh kind of unused pads. Um, and then you are going to soak that with that 65% formic acid, 15 to 20 milliliters for singles, 30 to 40 milliliters for doubles. Those pads can't, they don't really hold the 30 to 40 milliliters very well. So instead of trying to fit that in one pad, it's easier to just use two pads with 15 to 20 milliliters, which will get you to, to 30 or 40 milliliters. You are gonna place uh, one pad, or if you're doing a double, you can, you can do two pads at a time, um, on the top bars close to the brood area. If you are treating doubles, you are not putting this in between, you are putting it on the top bars of the top box. Um, the hive entrance has to be open and unobstructed for this to, to work and not harm your bees, um, but other entrances and cracks and everything should be closed up. Um, and then you're going to repeat this every four or five days for a total of six applications. So all of the organic treatments that I'm gonna talk about um, are are temperature sensitive. Um, this is a fumigant. It works by that, that formic acid evaporating and those formic acid fumes kind of 
um, circulating around in the hive and, and killing those mites. So the absolute temperature range is going to be 10 to 30 degrees. So below 10, it's just not fumigating enough for it to be effective. Uh, and then above 30, essentially, it's going to be fumigating so strongly that that is going to cause damage to your bees. It will kill brood. It will. It can kill queens and, and workers as well. Um, so your optimal temperature is usually about 15 to 25. So lower than the high and, and, and higher than that low temperature. So somewhere in the middle is ideal. Because you were repeating this six times for a full treatment, um, that range of four to five days can be played with slightly. If the next day that you're supposed to put that on, um, it's going to be way too hot. It's going to be, you know, above 30 degrees. You can wait an extra day, for example, to put it on. Or um, if you know later on in the week, it's going to be too hot, um, you could repeat you could exchange the pad, let's say on day three, if necessary, um, so that by that time that it's gonna be 35 degrees, most of the, the formic acid has already evaporated from those pads. So you wanna avoid at least the first couple of days that you put a new pad on um, those, those high temperatures because they can cause damage. And, and I should mention, when you come back to put a second pad, usually the first pad is either all chewed up and kind of pulled out of the hive already, so you don't need to worry about it, or it's, it's really dry, so you can just take it off and remove it. If it's still kind of wet and still has some formic acid, you can just kind of move that one back, put the next pad on, and so you'll have two pads on at that point. Um, and then when you come back for the, for example, for the third treatment, you remove the oldest one and, and put a new one on. So this is treating a double, that's why there are two pads there, um, but that's what the multiple application method will look like. The other way that this can be used is a single slow release application. Obviously, this is kind of a, a nicer option if you don't really want to make six trips out to your apiary to, to, to replace this. To do a full proper treatment, you need to do all six. So another option is to just do this one, which is only one application. It is the same as the, the other one in terms of being applied only spring or fall. It can't be used with honey supers. And there's also that withdrawal period of, of two weeks before adding honey supers. With the single slow release application method, you are using, instead of those little meat pads, you are using a material called Tentest, which is used in construction. You wanna make sure that you are using untreated Tentest because you can get Tentest that's been Kind of treated with or has tar in it and you, you don't want to use that one for the bee. So it's un, untreated 10 test. Um, you're going to get kind of a square of that and you're soaking 250 milliliters of that 65% formic acid in it. And then you're placing that in a perforated plastic bag. Um, you can kind of think of like the produce bags that you'd use, the, the Ziploc produce bags that have little holes in them. So you're going to put that in there. Um, to use this, you kind of want to put this not directly on the, the top bars, but maybe using two little pieces of wood or something to lift it up a little bit. And then because of the, um, the size of this, you're going to need to use a wooden rim to kind of accommodate that so you're not smashing it down when you put your inner cover on. Um, similar to the multiple application pads, if you are running a double, you are going to be putting this on the top bars of the top box, not in between the two. Um, and then hive entrances have to be open and, and unobstructed, but close your other entrances. This is going to be left in the hive for 21 to 30 days. And then the temperature considerations are going to be similar. So between 10 to 30 degrees is, is, the, uh, is the maximum or absolute range. The optimal is going to be around 15 to 25 degrees. So obviously, because you're only putting this out once, it is going to be sitting there for a longer time. There's, a, there's more of a chance that you're going to get, um, you're going to be exposed to one of those higher temperatures that could be damaging. Um, so try to keep in mind at least the first, you know, three or four days or so when you put that out, those are the ones you want to be the most concerned. If it's going to be above 30, at 30 or above 30 degrees, maybe wait a few extra days before you put that on. If it's 30 degrees on day 15 or day 20 or something like that, that's not as big of a deal because most of it will have, have kind of um, fumigated at that point. But you can see that on the right, that's the 10 test material in a perforated Ziploc bag. Um, and on the left, you can see the two little pieces of wood to keep it off of the top bars, as well as the wooden rim you would need to accommodate that size. So these other, the next two uh, commercial formic, pro, or formic acid uh, 
formulations. These have been both tested with honey supers. Um, and so they can be applied. They are two of the three uh, treatments that we have registered for use with honey supers. Um, so they can be applied any time of the year. Honey supers can be present. The application method for, and then sorry, the first one that I'm talking about are the MitoWay Quick Strips or Max. Both of these products are, are produced by Nod Apiaries. Um, MitoWay Quick Strips was kind of the original one that they that they kind of created there that, that's since been, a lot of people talk about it being replaced by Formic Pro. So Formic Pro and, and Max are both still available. So um, some people like Max better and want to continue to use it and it will still be available. So either one of these um, can be used. Um, but so the, with the, the Max in particular, the, so the instructions are slightly different from the two of them. So make sure that you're following the proper instructions um, for depending on which one you're using. So hive entrances, um, similar to the other formic acid products, hive entrances should be open and unobstructed, but try to close off any other entrances or gaps in, in the hive. You are going to remove the pads from the outer wrap. They're kind of in like a plastic wrap, but when you open that up, there's going to be two pads in there and they are wrapped in like a kind of like a wax paper. You don't remove the wax paper. That will just kind of release all of the, the gel basically that holds the, the formic acid in it. Um, you're just removing that outer plastic wrap and exposing the two pads. Um, you can then put two of those pads on the top bars close to the brood area. If you are using um, doubles, in this case, you are putting them in between the boxes, not on the top, top box. Um, and then you leave that in the hive for seven days. So that is the normal application method. This is a, a strong compound and it has been known to cause damage with, with brood and queens. Um, so especially if it's, if it's hotter, closer to that 30 degree range. Um, another option that is listed or an alternative way of using it that's listed on the, the label is to use one pad at a time. So the way you would do that is you'd place one pad on the top bars close to the brood area um, and then leave that on for two weeks instead of just those seven days. And then you replace it with, with the, the second pad. Um, they do note on the label though that this method may have reduced efficacy compared to the first method. So um, Obviously people don't wanna kill their queens or anything like that, but if you're using this in the middle of the season and your, your, uh, your varroa mite levels are maybe pretty low to begin with, you've monitored hopefully and they're, and they're low, you wanna knock them back a little bit, but you're not too, too concerned. Maybe using the second method um, and possibly having a little less efficacy is okay. You'll kind of protect your queens, um, but still knock down your mites. If you're putting it on in the middle of the season because you really need to get your mite levels down and they're really high, um, I would go with the first method. It is a little bit stronger, but it is kind of um, has higher efficacy and will, and will be a little bit better. Because of kind of how much is gonna be fumigating and coming off of these pads, the bees do need extra room to be able to kind of move away from it if, if it's um, fumigating a lot. So if you're treating a double, you don't need to worry about this. Um, but if you are treating a single, you do need to add an extra box. So if you're doing this in the middle of the summer and you have honey supers on already, then can, you've kind of already dealt with this. If you're using it at a time when you don't have a honey super on, just put an, an empty hun honey super on just to give them that extra room. And an empty hun honey super doesn't mean without frames. Um, the bees will just make a mess of that. I just mean an, an empty box with, with empty frames in it. Um, you can remove the pads after the treatment and, and you can compost those. Um, you can also just leave the pads and the bees will eventually just tear them up anyway. Uh, similar to before, the absolute temperature range is going to be 10 to 30 degrees. Um, the optimal temperature range is not listed on the, the label for the Max or for the Formic Pro. Um, but again, it's going to be similar to the other Formic products. It's going to be within that 10 to 30 degrees. So 15 to 25 is kind of what you're aiming for. Temperatures above 30 degrees, especially above 33, can lead to higher levels of bee mortality. So again, make sure that you are being careful with when you put these on, um, especially if you're gonna be doing the two pads at once, um, keep an eye on the weather and make sure that at the very least for the first you know, half of the treatment, it's not gonna be too, too hot um, or, or you could have higher bee, bee kills. But the picture on the left there um, shows the the pads there. So you can see that they're covered in like that, that 
waxy paper. So you don't want to remove that. You just remove the outer plastic wrap um, and then put those two pads on or put one pad on at a time. Um, but you can see the temperature range is listed on the, the little diagram in the bottom for whether you're using a one pad or two pads. And then it is also showing you that if you're putting this on a single, um, you need to put on a, a, a honey super. You can use a queen excluder, that's not a problem. If you are running doubles, you can either use honey supers or not. There's already enough space. And remember, you're putting those pads in between the two boxes, um, not on the top box. Um, so Formic Pro, this is the other, this is the newer not apiary product. Um, this is also applied any time of the year, can be used when, when honey supers are present. It's very similar to, to Mitoway Quick Strips. There's just some slight differences um, with how you use it that, that you need to pay attention to. But also hive entrances all need to be open and unobstructed. You are also going to remove pads from the outer. It's more like a foil-like wrap, so you remove that. Um, but then again, don't take off the, the papery wrap that's on the actual pads themselves. And then you can place two pads on the top bars close to the brood area in between boxes, just like Max if you're treating a double. But you are leaving these on the hive for double the time, for 14 days, not for seven days. There is also an alternative method for using Formic Pro um, that's a little bit a little bit less strong. Um, so you can use one pad at a time. So you place one pad on, um, you leave it in the hive for 10 days, and then you replace it with the second pad and leave it in the hive for another 10 days. Again, because you're gonna be trying to pay attention to the temperature when you're using this, putting in the second pad on can be delayed a little bit if necessary. So if once the 10 days are up for the first pad, it's gonna be 30, 35 degrees for a couple of days. You can wait a couple extra days before you put on the second pad, um, but try to keep that, that delay, that, that time in between um, as little as possible. So 10 days and then 10 days um, right after that. Um, same thing with Max. If you were treating singles, you do need an extra box on there. So a super or an extra box should be placed on the hive to give them more space. Um, the pads also don't need to be removed. They, they can just be left and the bees will kind of chew them up or you can remove them and compost them. They're a little bit thicker and harder than the Max. Um, so I think it's probably easier to, to remove and compost these as opposed to letting the bees chew them up. Um, but that's what they look like in the bottom left. They're a little bit, I think they're a little bit larger but at the very moment, the very least, they're they're definitely like harder or, or kind of um, thicker than the than the Mitoway quick strips. Same thing with temperature considerations. Ten to thirty degrees is that absolute temperature, but you're going to want to aim for a little bit within that. Um, once you go above thirty, especially above thirty three degrees, it can lead to higher levels of bee mortality. Um, so the little diagram on the bottom right just shows you how to use those. Um, so if you're using two pads, same thing, you're either putting those on on a single with a queen excluder and a, and a super, or you're putting them in between the two boxes of a double, whether or not there are supers on there. You do it the exact same way if you're doing it with a single pad, um, same position anyway when you use it, but then you're leaving it for 10 days and 10 days instead of a total of 14. All right, so those are the four products that are registered um, that use formic acid as the active ingredient. The next one we'll talk about is oxalic acid, which is an organic acid. Um, it is not fully understood what it acts on, but it is likely cells and, and cell contents. So again, the mode of action, not fully understood for oxalic acid. We just, we know that it does work though, and it does kill mites. Um, however, it is the low pH or the acidity that that is necessary to kill mites. And that isn't actually gonna happen when you when you buy this oxalic acid, it is a, a crystal. Um, and then it's gonna to need to be, um, there's two different methods that, it, that it's used in, um, but the dry crystals themselves don't actually kill mites. So it does need to be mixed with water. Um, and that is what causes it to, to have that low pH, that acidity that kills mites. So in the case of using the drizzle, which I'll talk about, um, it is mixed with, with sugar syrup, water and sugar syrup. And that's what, um, what allows it to be acidic. If you were using it as a vaporizer, it is coming in contact with water vapor in the air and that's what's making it acidic, but it does need that water. Um, it needs one of those two methods for it to work. The actual dry crystals um, don't kill mites. I mean, other arthropods, what oxalic acid does is, is it causes oxidative stress. Um, 
which I talked about a little bit before with formic acid, which is going to specifically destroy cells and cell contents by those free radicals. So it is likely similar to how it's, how it's killing mites as well. Oxalic acid actually has to be absorbed by the mite for it to kill them, and it is more easily absorbed through the mite's tarsal pads or through its feet than its cuticles. So um, if you were to put a little drop of oxalic acid with, with sugar syrup on the kind of the carapace or the back of the mite, um, it doesn't actually kill it very easily. It's the, the mite almost has to kind of touch it with its feet while it's moving, um, and that, that absorbs through into the mite's body much better, and that's what actually will, will kill the mite. But again, for the mode of action, not fully known, but it is likely oxidative stress and the, the resultant cell and cell content destruction that, that kills the mites. In terms of application, um, oxalic, excuse me, oxalic acid can be applied in spring or fall, um, but you want it to be specifically when there is minimal brood presence. So not just normal spring or fall, but we're usually talking about very early spring or late fall. Um, so at this time of year already in March, um, we're not out in our hives and, you know, there's, there's snow out there, but the bees, the, the queen would have started laying eggs already. So there is already brood. So it's going to be less effective if you use it in the spring. Um, and, and then in the fall, those overwintering bees are going to be hatching out of the brood or emerging out of the brood until usually kind of mid to late October. So it's not really going to be super effective unless you're using it um, kind of after that. So kind of late October, or early November. So this makes it not super great for a for a, a main treatment, but it is a great kind of cleanup treatment after you use and, and remove your, your main treatment. Um, it is not registered for use with honey super, so it does need to be used at a time when you don't have honey supers on, which it's not registered for, but it also is not very effective at those times either because there are, there's brood present um, and oxalic acid does not penetrate the broods. The, the brood cappings, which is why it needs to be kind of used outside of that range. So there are two application methods. You can use the drizzle application method or the vaporization. For the drizzle, you are mixing 35 grams of the oxalic acid crystals into one liter of warm sugar syrup. Usually we, the, the instructions tell you to make the one-to-one -one sugar syrup. I know a lot of beekeepers will have lots of two-to-one sugar syrup available um, and you, you can use that as well. So either one is fine. Um, but you're using one liter of it and 35 grams, which makes 3.5% concentration. And you are going to drizzle five milliliters of this solution into each populated B space. Um, so when you're using this, remember you're gonna be using this late in the fall, the bees should be clustered. Um, so ideal temperature for this, which is not on the slide there, but you wanna use this when it's, it needs to be cold enough that the bees are clustering. So if it's a day that's kind of above 10 degrees or even around 10 degrees, that's not really ideal because they're going to be moving too much. They might even be flying. Um, an ideal temperature would be kind of zero to five degrees. It can be a little bit colder than that, but you also don't want to open your hive if it's, you know, minus 20 out there, but around zero. Um, so the bees are all in the hive. They're all clustered. Um, they're not flying or anything like that. When they're clustered, the bees aren't going to be in every space in between every frame. This drizzle method only works if those that, that drizzle comes in contact with the bees and then therefore the mites that are on them. Um, so this is not going to work if you just spray it into those empty spaces. So you're only putting it into um, a populated bee space, so a space between frames that there are actually bees there. Um, so you're going to do a maximum of 50 milliliters per colony, and that is the same whether it is a single or a double. So if you're doing this on a double, um, you're going to have to crack the, the two boxes apart to get an idea of where the cluster is located so that you're kind of drizzling that over all of the bees. For the vaporization, you are going to seal up any holes in the hive. The vaporizers use two grams of the oxalic crystals, and then you're going to follow the vaporizer instructions for best results after that. There are a lot of different vaporizers available. Um, so I'm not gonna tell you how to use that because it might be slightly different between a couple different vaporizers. Um, but usually the general thing is that you heat it for a few minutes <clears throat> and then you leave it and that's gonna kind of fumigate. So it's sublimating, it's going from a crystal to a vapor. Um, within the hive, you'll shut it off then and kind of just leave it. And then once it's cooled down, you remove it and go to the next hive. That being said, in the way I just described it there, it is important, that cool down period is important. Um, a lot of people are under the impression that vaporizers um, are faster than using the drizzle because they can be you know, used really quickly. But often if you're using it really quickly, 
also, if you are buying a vaporizer that is advertised as being extra fast, um, what is often happening in those cases is that it's heating up very quickly to very high temperatures and it's not cooling down in between. Um, if you are heating the, if the element thing is, is going above 189 degrees Celsius and heating up the oxalic acid above that temperature, um, you are no longer fumigating oxalic acid. Um, it is, it's breaking down and decomposing into carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and water vapor. So it is actually not effective anymore. So kind of don't buy into the extra fast way of using this. To use it properly, it does need to cool down in between. So you can see the oxalic acid on the left there. That's using the drizzle method. That's using a drench gun. You can just use a syringe as long as the syringe can hold about 50 milliliters or hold 50 milliliters or more. Um, and you can see that that person is wearing gloves. So you do need to be careful when using oxalic acid. This is one of the vaporizers you could use. You are gonna need to plug that into a car battery or something um, and then heat that up to actually vaporize the hive. A question that we often get asked is kind of which, which method do we think is better? We, at Tech Transfer, we tend to try to direct people more towards the, the drizzle method for a number of reasons, but kind of the main one is safety. It, it is a lot easier on you and safer for you to use the drizzle as opposed to the vaporizer, but, but it does come down to personal preference for sure. But I'll go over some of the kind of the main points for the two of them. If we're talking about PPE um, or personal protective equipment, the drizzle really just requires gloves, um, you should wear goggles just in case you splash it. And then loose clothing is, is not an absolute must, but it, it can help because if you do splash it and you're wearing tight fitting clothing, obviously that can more easily absorb onto your skin. Um, so wearing loose clothing would, would be better, especially if you have a bee suit, you don't need to worry about it because it's probably loose fitting to begin with. Um, but a little bit less PPE. When you're talking about vaporization, you need gloves and goggles as well, but you do need um, a face mask with a proper uh, acid base filter. Um, you don't want to breathe in oxalic acid fumes. Um, they are pretty damaging. Um, in terms of equipment that you would need to, to be able to use this, this, um, this treatment method, um, for the drizzle, you just need a container for mixing that sugar syrup and oxalic acid and then your syringe. Um, for the vaporizer, you would need some sort of power source that you can bring with you into the yard, as well as the vaporizer itself. The safety risk with drizzle is just that skin contact. With the vaporization, there's the skin contact as well as again, inhaling those, those vapors. So taking in too much um, oxalic acid, whether ingesting it, absorbing it through the skin or, or inhaling it um, can cause crystals to form in, in, your, in your kidneys and, and cause uh, kidney stones. So not something you really wanna play around with. In terms of bee safety, um, there is more research done on the drizzle. Um, so that's kind of one of the main reasons there is a difference between these two, but it does seem like the drizzle is a little bit less safe for the bees. So it can be repeated no more than two times on bees. Um, otherwise, after that, it's gonna start to cause actually crystals to develop in, in their, their kind of equivalent of a kidney and, and it can kill them as well. Um, the vaporization can be repeated more than twice safely. Um, there's just less research on it though, and that doesn't really mean go wild with it and, and use it 10 times in a row. Um, it is also obviously still affecting the bees. It just seems a little bit safer for them. Um, in terms of efficiency, again, some people think that the vaporizer is faster, but if you're using it too fast, you are not letting it cool down properly. And then you're likely just decomposing that oxalic acid. So um, two minutes for the drizzle usually per hive, where it's more like four minutes, sometimes a bit more for the vaporizer. So it's not actually faster. Um, so again, I would definitely recommend the drizzle. That's usually what we recommend at TTP. That's what we use both as at tech transfer, as well as um, the individual tech transfer members on our own hives use. So um, that's what I would recommend. But, but again, both of them are our options. Um, so the next two products, Thymovar and AP Life Bar, these are both natural acaricides and the active compound is thymol in, in both of them. Thymovar, it's just thymol. In AP Life Bar, it's thymol, but it, it also contains eucalyptol, menthol, and camphor. Um, all of those are monoterpenoids. So again, like formic acid, they act on a bunch of different things. Um, GABA activated receptors, cells and cell contents, octopamine receptors, acetylcholinesterase, so a lot of different um, activities. So GABA um, stands for gamma aminobutyric acid. It's a, it's a neurotransmitter as well, and it's going to bind to voltage-gated channels, but chlorine channels this time, not sodium. 
Um, and these are important for both deactivating muscles and glands as well as activating them. So in, in humans, GABA is more of an inhibitory neurotransmitter. In insects and mites, it can kind of do both, but both of those things are important for our muscles to act. They kind of need to be activated, but also shut off to be able to actually control their function. Um, so monoterpenoids, they block GABA activated receptors, which means um, they cause kind of uh, paralysis and, and weakness and loss of activity. Um, monoterpenoids also block and bind to um, octopamine receptors similar to amitraz like in apivar. Um, so same thing, they cause that loss of activity, weakness, and eventually paralysis and death. They are also pretty strong chemicals themselves, so they can cause oxidative stress um, and destroy cells and cell contents. And they're also known to um, act on that same enzyme, that acetylcholine, Polyesterase that Kumafos works on, um, but in instead of turning that off or shutting it down, they increase its activity. So it kind of has the opposite effect. So if it increases its activity enough, they basically um, clean up those neurotransmitters too effectively, and they they kind of prevent the nerve signal from from really strongly being sent. So they can they can also cause weakness and paralysis at high levels. Um, so again, overall cell and cell content destruction, loss of activity, weakness, paralysis um, is what is killing the mites in this case. There are two products again that I mentioned, Thymavar and Apilifar. Um, Thymavar can be applied in spring or fall, cannot be used when honey supers are present. And there is a withdrawal period of two weeks before adding honey supers. Thymavar looks like these wafers, these kind of long, thin wafers. Um, if you were using a single, you were going to use one wafer and break it in half. If you were using or treating a double, you're going to use two full-size wafers. These are placed on the top bars outside of the central brood area. I will show you that in the next slide to give you a, a visual of what, of what I mean by that. Um, and you're doing this on the top bars of the top box if you're treating doubles, not in between. You're going to leave those wafers on for three to four weeks and then replace them with another set of wafers for another three to four weeks. So for a single, you will use one wafer broken in half, three to four weeks, and then another wafer for another three or four weeks broken in half. Um, so two in total. For double, you will use four wafers for a full treatment. Absolute temperature range is a little bit warmer than formic, so 13 to 30 degrees. Again, if it's too low, it's not going to fumigate enough. If it's too high, doesn't usually kill bees as strongly as formic acid does, but the bees don't like it and they will, it will sometimes kill brood and the, it can cause the bees to abscond or leave the hive if it's too hot. Um, so the optimal temperature range is gonna be a little bit narrower with, with thymavar, so ideally 20 to 25 or so. Um, there is a, um, in the, the label instructions, there is an alternative way to use it or, or at least a, um, an instruction in case it's gonna to be too hot. So if the temperatures are gonna be above that 30 degrees for the first few days of the treatment, um, it's recommended that you only put half of the dose on at first, then wait three to seven days and then put on the other half of the treatment and then leave that for the full treatment period or the rest of the treatment period. So on the left there, you can see one of the wafers um, broken in half. Um, so this would be to treat a single, um, but in the diagram on the right, you can see you can use two full wafers for a double. If you have one and a half, like a, a deep box and then a medium box as, as, your, as your brood nest, you can use um, three, three halves of the wafers to, to do that. Um, and so the, the circle there, this is in French, but this, the circle there is the, is the brood nest. So again, similar to the, the other strips that I talked about earlier, where you're, you're putting it specifically in the brood nest, so where there's actual brood cappings and, and where the, the bees are gonna emerge and have mites on them. Um, so with thymavar, you're putting it kind of just outside the area of where that brood is gonna be. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be in the corners of the hive. If there's mostly brood just in the middle of the hive, you can put it a little bit closer. Um, the other uh, thymavar containing compound is apilifar. Um, same considerations, so applied spring or fall. Um, honey supers can't be present, withdrawal period of two weeks before adding honey supers. Um, this one is going to come into a tablet that you're going to break into or cut into four pieces and place um, on the top bars around the brood area, kind of in the four corners, essentially. Um, and you're actually going to repeat this one three times, not twice. So you put that on, remove the pieces after seven to 10 days and replace with a second tablet, wait another seven to 10 days 
days and replace it with a third tablet. And then they switch it up and the third tablet should be left on for 12 days. The um, absolute temperature range is even warmer for this one. So 18 to 35 degrees, um, but your optimal is still gonna be about 20 to 25 or so with this. And so you can see it there. That's one of the tablets. Um, they're green, um, easier. You can see the person has a pair of scissors in their hand. So you're gonna wanna cut that up into four pieces and put it around the brood area in the four corners. All right, and then the final treatment here, HopGuard 2. Um, this is another organic acid and the active compound is hops beta acids. Um, in terms of what it acts on, not fully understood, but likely feeding behavior of the mites and then grooming behavior um, in the bees, but I'll talk about that a bit more. So the, the mode of action is not fully understood, but um, in other mites, it's, it's known that hops beta acids, caught, beta acids causes a reduction in feeding and egg laying, which leads to kind of disrupted reproduction and, and feeding and then death with the mites. Um, so likely causing something similar in, in varroa mites as well. There have been studies that looked at hop guard specifically in honeybees. And what they showed was that bees that were exposed to hop guard showed increased grooming, um, especially aloe grooming, which is um, when they groom their, their nest mates as opposed to auto grooming, which is grooming themselves. Um, and then there was also observed higher levels of mite drop um, and mite damage. So the mites that fell off the bees were, were damaged as if they had been bitten or so by the bees. Um, though the study does point out that they never specifically observed the bees themselves grooming the mites off. They just saw the bees grooming more and damaging and damaged mites on, on the sticky boards. Um, so it could be something like that, that it's causing the bees to groom more. Um, but however, when hops beta acids are used directly on mites in the lab, it does kill the mites. So it has to be something more than just the grooming behavior. So again, it's, it's likely that, that feeding and egg laying reduction um, that it can cause. So not fully understood, but the mode of action is likely removal and damage by bees combined with some sort of feeding and, and reproduction disruption. To use HopGuard 2, um, this is the third treatment. So Max, uh, Formic Pro, and HopGuard 2, all of those are uh, registered for use with honey supers. Um, so it can be used any time of the year. Honey supers can be present. However, times when there is high brood production are not ideal for HopGuard because it doesn't penetrate the brood cappings and it's a relatively short um, time frame that the, that the treatment is used. So it's not super effective if there's a lot of brood, um, which is unfortunate because it is, you know, it, there, there's definitely a gap in terms of treatments that are um, registered for use during a honey flow. So having one that is registered for that period, but, but doesn't work all that well is, is not ideal. Um, you want to ensure that the daytime temperatures are above 10 degrees to be using HopGuard. The bees do kind of need to move around and, and touch those strips. To use it, there's, there's this package filled with these kind of cardboardy strips in this brown liquid or goo. Um, to use it, you're gonna open this, the plastic or the, the, the wrapper, and then use some sort of plastic bin, remove those, those strips and then pour that, that goo or that brown liquid all over the strips to really coat them. Um, and then similar to the synthetic acaricide strips, you're gonna use one strip for every five frames of bees. So a total of two or a maximum of two, sorry, for a single and a maximum of four for a double. You're gonna place them in the brood nest, similar to how you'd put an apivar strip or uh, an apistan strip in. And then you can remove the strips after 14 to 30 days, which is, which is obviously a pretty big range, 14 to 30. So you can use one set of strips for, for 30 full days. The best efficacy though is seen if you do basically double that treatment. So instead you put two strips in for 14 days, then you remove those and then put another set of strips um, for another 14 days. So this can be a little bit on the expensive side and to use it kind of properly at the, to the, the most effective, you are gonna use it for a total of a total of four strips in a single for 30 days for it to, to work. Um, and you can use that up to three or four times per year. Pay attention to the label for that one. Um, I believe HopGuard 2 can be used up to three times per year. There is a newer formulation, HopGuard 3, um, that I believe can be used four times per year. Um, and that's what the strips look like. Um, these brown gooey covered kind of cardboard strips, you're gonna put them over top of a, of a frame like that. Um, and then 
usually instead of kind of leaving a big gap in between that you put them a little bit closer to each other and kind of diagonal like you can see on the picture on the right there that's usually how they're placed all right so those are all of the treatments that are registered for for use here um, as well as how they how to kind of use them the considerations around temperature and placement and all that um, as well as kind of the mode of action and how they biologically how they kill the mites um, i'm just going to talk very briefly about resistance because it is an important thing if we're talking about treatments so resistance to chemical treatments um, in the mites, it's going to happen as a result of one of three or maybe a combination of these methods. Um, so target site insensitivity. So that is when um, the target site that the chemical acts on changes slightly so that that chemical no longer binds to it or can affect it. Number two, enhanced detoxification. So maybe the chemical can still get into the mite. It it just doesn't get to have an effect because the, the mite has developed enhanced ways of, of detoxifying and getting rid of that chemical. Um, and then finally, reduced cuticular penetration would mean that the chemical might still be very fully active against the mite, um, but they found ways to, to kind of prevent that chemical from getting up through their cuticle and, and actually absorbing it. So if it can't get into the mite, um, it can't kill it. So I've used different colors there. Um, the red was the same that I used for the synthetic acaricides, the blue for the organic. Um, so that is because you can see any of those three methods used for any type of treatment as, as a way that the mites might become resistant, but it is more, um, more common for, for synthetic strips or synthetic compounds to become um, mites to become resistant to them through the first one, through target site and sensitivity, because of how specific their binding site is, it's easier for mites to develop resistance to synthetic chemicals in general, but also through this, this target site and sensitivity. Um, whereas the organic treatments, it's harder, it's not impossible, but it is harder for mites to develop resistance to, to organic acids and natural care sites. Um, but it's, but excuse me, especially number two and three there, those methods can be used, they can be developed by mites and they can become resistant to um, even natural chemicals that way as well. So it's really important um, that you're using chemical treatments properly. Improper use of chemical treatments is what speeds the development of resistance. And what that means could be um, using it for less time than you should. So maybe you're supposed to leave these strips in for 42 days, but you only leave it in for three weeks instead. So the mites aren't getting exposed to a full dose. Um, you might be using maybe one strip instead of two strips when you need to. So again, they're, they're being exposed to a lower dose. Um, sometimes beekeepers will do the opposite. They'll put the strips in, but instead of taking them out after 42 days, for example, they leave them in over the winter. So in this case, the mites are exposed to the full dose, but then the chemical stays in the hive in low, in low amounts week after week after week over the, the, the winter. And the mites are exposed to these very low amounts that allow um, resistance to develop. So all of these are kind of improper use of the chemicals, which is similar to if you know, you're prescribed something by your doctor and instead of taking one pill every day, um, you take one pill once a week. So you're, you're giving the, um, the organism that you're supposed to be treating um, less of a dose than it should be getting, less of a dose than these treatments have been studied and, and kind of their, their um, instructions based around. Um, and so those are the ways that you can kind of develop resistance or speed the development of resistance. So it's very, very important that you're using um, chemical treatments properly and, and following those instructions. So just some take home messages. Um, there are a number of options available to beekeepers for the control of varroa mites, and those include both synthetic and organic treatments in case you, you don't want to, you want to do organic management, for example. Um, doesn't mean don't treat, it just means you have different options available to you. Um, always, always, always follow the label instructions when using treatments so that you are using them properly and, and not allowing resistance to develop, um, but you're also making sure that they're effective and you're not harming yourself or the bees. And along that line, make sure you're wearing appropriate personal protective equipment. Be mindful of temperature considerations, especially when we're talking about organic treatments, um, too cold and they're not gonna be effective, too hot and most of them can cause damage. So make sure you're trying to be within that, that temperature range. Um, and then the last one there in bold again, proper use of treatments is very important, as well as doing things like incorporating cultural control methods, um, using disease resistant stock, stuff that Kelsey will talk about more on Thursday, incorporating all of that in with the proper use of treatments, rotating treatments, all of those are important ways to kind of help 
fight mites while preventing the development or slowing the development of chemical resistance. All right, so thank you so much for listening and I'm, I'm happy to answer any of your questions.